you know, I, I consulted for big food in addition to my clinical practice. Uh -huh. I was, um, I was on the wrong side of the war. I was helping sell, you know, sugar and, you know, oils and excitotoxins to, you know, to the public. And I feel very guilty about it now. I am, I, I'm trying to make up for it. Uh, but long story short, just kind of fast forwarding to what actually worked for me was I, I had to switch paradigms. At some point, I had to stop trying to love myself thin and recognize that there was this part of my anatomy, my, my reptilian brain, that um, doesn't really know logic or love. It knows eat, mate, or kill. It's like a bad college drinking game. And it's a very powerful part of our anatomy. It's the part of us that is responsible for our survival. Mm -hmm. um, so really prioritize the acquisition of calories and nutrition when those opportunities are available. And that the big food companies are targeting that part of the brain um, with these hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and oil and salt and excitotoxins. And they're designed to hit the bliss point in the reptilian brain without giving us enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And then, you know, all the fat cats in white suits with mustaches are really, really good at advertising this stuff so that we think that we need it to survive. And people think that advertising doesn't affect them, but I can tell you from all of my experience, it affects you more when you think that because your cells resistance is down. So they're very powerful forces in society that are targeting this part of your brain that has the ability to push your rational thinking out of the way. Okay, what does this have to do with why I called my reptilian brain, my inner pig, and how, that, how did that help me? Um, you don't have to call it a pig. You can call it your food monster. You can call it your inner Betty or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I did need a way to know when this thing was active. And I needed a way to wake up. I needed something that would stimulate a very primitive feeling. Um, I know all this in retrospect. It was just an experiment that I did on my own. I wasn't going to teach this back then. And so what would happen was I would make a rule. Like I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. And that way, if I was in a Starbucks and there was a chocolate bar at the counter and I heard this voice in my head that said, you know what, Glenn, even though you said you're not going to have chocolate on a weekday and today's Wednesday, you worked out hard enough. This, this is not going to ruin your, your, you're not going to gain any weight. It's really fine. It'll be just as easy to start your silly diet tomorrow. Yippee, go ahead and get some. Let's go have it. I would say, wait a minute. That's not me. That's my inner pig. Chocolate on a Wednesday is pig slop. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. That started this whole journey. That, like that's what, that was the origin of what created the foundation that let me get better. What I know now is that it set up a kind of a trip wire where there were healthy thoughts and unhealthy thoughts about food. Like if I use my best thinking to come up with a rule that I wanted to follow, then I had thoughts that would suggest that I could follow it and then thoughts that I would suggest that I couldn't. I, this allowed me to wake up when those thoughts were just starting to become active when I could still control them, right? And it it shoved a wever between stimulus and response. Before there was an automation loop that was going on, you know, smell of coffee, had a good workout, see the chocolate bar at the counter, um, eat the chocolate bar. It was almost as if I wasn't there through the whole process, taking out the money, paying for it, going to my car, going to the back of the parking lot, opening it and eating it. Um, it. It's almost as if that was all on an automatic loop. And I know now that the brain really looks to automate the acquisition of um, you know, calories and nutrition. And these are these are the modern food environment has so many sources of concentrated calories without nutrition um, that we didn't evolve with on the savannah. Like we we didn't we didn't have chocolate bars and Doritos and Pop Tarts and pizza and pasta on the savannah. And so these things, they create these automatic habit loops. And this is one way. This is a way that I happen to have figured it out for myself. I was not going to teach it to pry apart, to set up a tripwire. It's like a fire alarm that went off as soon as the, the reptilian brain was active. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to do all sorts of things in that, in that space. So that, that's why I called it a pig. I find that 
it's perfectly possible for people to recover. I've worked with over 2,000 people at this point. It's perfectly possible for people to recover without calling it a pig. Um, um, but you do need something. What doesn't work is to think of it as your inner wounded child. What doesn't work is to think, think of it as this part of you that was lonely and abandoned and you know used the chocolate to survive, even though it might be true that that's how this habit loop started. The habit loop is so strong and the stimuli are so strong in society that you need a shock to the system. You, you have to be able to have something that wakes you up and you say, whoa, who's in charge here? I don't want this thing to be in charge. I want to be in charge. Um, so that was the basis of how my recovery started. I can tell you what I did from there if you want to, or you can ask me more questions about my inner pig. <laughs>